Hello, Daniel. It's nice to have you on today. You're Hi, coming from Sweden. You're located in Uppsala? Yeah, Uppsala. Did I spell it right? <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, Uppsala, Sweden. And uh, yeah, happy to be with you, Tilman. Uh, I hope we're having a quite interesting interview. I will st start before I show the disclaimer on the message from our sponsor, Mitinko, <laughs> it is today, with a small question where you I ask you or I want to imagine you that you're at the speed dating where on the one table there is a company you want to invest in and you have 30 seconds to say hello and who you are and this company you can think about investing long term and staying in a relationship with them on the next table you will meet an investor you think that might be quite interesting for your stock or fund we will get later to this um, yeah. and you have 30 seconds and uh, i will <laughs> invite you to start saying hello to the company you invested in and, and if the 30 seconds are over i will let the death star play we're doing and 30 seconds with the company and then 30 with the, yeah. with the investor okay so let's start with the company yeah <laughs> Yeah, hello. Um, we are um, uh, an investment company, which uh, we run our own money. So uh, we are going to be with you long term. We um, are always interested in what your plans are over the next two to five years. And uh, um, we will be helpful in any way we can. And uh, yeah, also see my looks. Now you're at the investor. Yeah. <laughs> so to investors, we're speed dating. Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, it's very unlikely that we will maintain our returns so far. Uh, we are very likely to, at some point, have a big drop um, top to bottom. Uh, that said, me and my family have all our liquid net worth invested in this company and uh, in the same strategy. Thank you. You have done the Death Star test very well. <laughs> and I want to give you some time to relax because it was kind of a challenge. Oh, it's a tough and, starting question, yeah. Yeah, and uh, start with the disclaimer and our sponsor message. Here we go. As always, uh, here's the disclaimer. You will find it also linked below. It says, do your own work. All we are doing here is a qualified and hopefully fun talk. But... Um, It's no advice and no recommendation. Always do your own work. And I also want to drop the message of our sponsor here. It's Mitimco. Mitimco is supporting this episode. Mitimco manages the financial assets of MIT through partnerships for talent and investment managers all over the world. Mitimco is eager to connect with emerging fund managers. They invest alongside young and unconventional investment firms and bringing resources and a creative perspective to the fund management journey. Whether you're a one-person shop just getting started or a team of investors building something unconventional, Mitimco would love to hear from you. No firm is too small, too early or too uninstitutional. You can drop them a line at partner at mitimco.org, partner at mitimco.org. And visit their site, mitimco.com Emerging Managers. The ones who are watching this video on YouTube already see the site. And I also will link it below in the show notes of the podcast as well. So you can easily reach out to them and say hello. So thank you, Daniel. I hope you had time to relax. And maybe let's start with your background. Who are these guys behind you on the wall? Or there's also a woman. And why do they inspire you? Yeah, there's two women. Uh, they might not have so much to do with my background, actually. But uh, yeah, it was a fun thing to, uh, you know, have some good company here. And I think uh, what all of these people uh, behind uh, have done is they have really gone their own way. Uh, they have... Um, They are very thoughtful, all of them. Um, and yeah, I guess most of them are geniuses too, <laughs> in their own ways. So yeah, you might see the two, two women might be interesting to lift out. So one is uh, Yasinda Ardern, uh, 
the, the prime minister of New Zealand, so a very young one. And uh, there's also uh, J.K. Rowling, so so the one that wrote the books about uh, Harry Potter. Uh, she um, she came from like almost nothing, like. Uh, I think she said she's, she was as poor as one can be uh, without being homeless and, you know, was writing the books and yeah, the rest is history, I guess. So, yeah. But uh, uh, in terms of my background, you know, uh, 12 years ago, I, uh, I did not know anything about investing. So I didn't know what a balance sheet was. I didn't know essentially what revenue was. Uh, I had a, a basic understanding that companies sold things. Uh, they had a cost of doing that, and you know, then they turned out turned out a profit. <laughs> That's about the extent of it. So, and, did books help you to get a deeper understanding of investing? Oh, a lot. Um, I think it's interesting to understand where I come from. So. My background is in engineering physics with a specialization in, in optimization, so mathematics, really. So op I was at the end there, I was optimizing uh, cancer treatment for radiation, um, uh, radiation treatment for cancer patients, sorry. And, um, and also in elite sports. So I have been in the national Swedish national team playing badminton for probably 12 or 13 years before that. So when I um, had my first, uh, you know, bout into investing, I um, I've always liked to walk around in libraries. So when we would go abroad with my family, we would go, you know, they would want to see, I don't know, uh, mom and dad would probably want to see, uh, you know, some uh, do some sightseeing, see some important monuments, and I'd be much happier to go to the library. So I was like. Yeah, okay, let, let's let's go buy a bookstore. And uh, so about uh, 2008 or so, with no idea about the financial crisis, by the way, um, I was walking around the bookstore and I sort of uh, wanted to, uh, I didn't really know what to do with my life, to be honest with you. And it was, uh, it was this book that said, you know, the business of life. So Snowball, uh, the Alice Schroeder book about Buffett. So I picked that up and, and um, uh, I, I didn't think too highly of the financial industry uh, at that time. I, uh, and in this book, it was like, you know, you can really do good in this industry. And uh, it, it really clicked with me. And, and uh, this was somewhere around 2008 9 I'm not sure uh, for some reason I put the book down I you know I felt it was the, the, it really clicked I put the book down and I, I can't tell you what I did for uh, two years probably I, I didn't do anything investment related uh, I met my wife so maybe that was it why I never really uh, uh, you know I was uh, newly in love and, and, and all that so Maybe that was it. But uh, a few years later, a friend uh, of mine came to me and he said, yeah, you're good with math. Why don't you help me look at this company? And it was a situation where company A was owning shares in company B, basically. Company B's shares had gone up a lot. And uh, so they were actually worth more than company A's total market cap at the time. And I was like, you know, this is exactly what I read about in, in uh, Snowball, security analysis and so on. And, and uh, yeah, so I went home, did, did the work and uh, we ended up investing and uh, say five, within five, six months, it had worked out. So, so it was really, I was like, this can be done. And um, um, from then on, I, I sort of started dabbling, you know, doing all kinds of mistakes you can do, I think, um, that many of us do when we start out. And uh, about um, what was your favorite mistake? <laughs> Where you think? <laughs> oh, there are many. Uh, this, it's so much worth this mistake that uh, I really like. I did it. Yeah, like I, I, I can't point to one which was like extremely costly, but I can point to one which was so extremely embarrassing now afterwards. So it was a, uh, it was actually an actual coal mine in Mongolia, I think. <laughs> they had this you know 
uh, you know, good salesman as a CEO, I think. And, and it was, uh, it's hard to think of something worse. Like when you, when you think about it, I was like one of the first, I like, you know, these classic things like biotech, like uh, things, you know, which are hot. So, so uh, I did many of those mistakes, but for some reason during those very first years, I also did a few good things. And I realized, you know, when we summed up the year, I realized that, so one, perhaps the, the investment I was most confident in had actually done really well, you know, it will, it could be up uh, 50%, but most of the others were so poor. So we, we were basically break even. So those initial three years, I, I remember them pretty well because at the end of three years, I think we were up uh, about three or 4%, so about, about 0 0.8 compounded or so. <laughs> and that was that was good because considering how how little I knew and how, how bad I was, uh, that was a gift, like a free education, basically. So I, I probably deserved to to lose a lot more than we actually did. But anyways, I think that one of the key moments there was uh, in, in 2013. So during these years, when I when I started uh, looking for for ways that would work. Uh, one, uh, and I, I had all these, uh, you know, you're looking at some studies, you were, you were reading all kinds of things. And there was this one study that was very um, attractive to me. And I felt, you know, now maybe I have it. And uh, I realized that, that a study, so, so the study was something about uh, investing in in stocks that would be included in an index or so or something like that. I don't I don't remember the details, but basically, when you peeled on a little bit, you you realize that that was only a, an effect of the financial crisis. So you realize the study was basically uh, flawed, and it was sort of my you know final hope to find something that would work. And and after I realized that that was completely um, uh, yeah, not worth anything as well. I went back to this sort of boring portfolio that I was already managing. And I said, you know, let's try to aim for 15% a year. Um, and so that was the key thing, I think, that, that I sort of came to peace with uh, that there are no shortcuts. You know, you just have to do the work. You have to understand more and more. And hopefully, you know, you'll do, do well doing it. It's interesting that you're saying that there are no shortcuts. Where did you also, are there other topics where you had to learn to go the long way as well in your journey into investing? I mean, elite sports is, is pretty much the same. Like, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the one that remains, uh, I mean, the ones you'll see, you know, winning tournaments winning championships are usually the ones that that stay the course right so um, uh, there is always like 10 15 years probably behind every uh, championship behind every so, so that was certainly one point but I don't know. I came in with this, uh, I think, beginner's mind, and I figured that there should be some ways to to do this. It it sort of feels like there are maybe not shortcuts, but but you know methods. And at the end of the day, today we, I also have a method, of course. But it's really there's no like uh, magic pill or or it's really just basic work and if you do it long enough you you will uh, become a little bit better at it over time and, and uh, yeah that, that that but that is a big uh, big insight actually I think because uh, it's easy to to try to look for all these you know technical things and and uh, yeah short short term uh, thinking really which is doable for some but extraordinary hard to do successfully for most, I think. Um, so, yeah. With books, you have a certain chance to get quicker and with <laughs> a smaller budget to the wisdom of other people. And I asked you before about your three favorite books and maybe you can show them and introduce to the audience. 
because you have some behind yeah, you. Yeah, uh, so three favorites are, are really hard, but hang on a second. Well, Let me pick up these three. Uh, we so, can also, if you send me the list of the others, yeah. I can also put them in the transcript. Sure, no problem. Uh, I think uh, this is a great one, uh, the Captain Class. Um, and this is uh, the author here, Sam Walker. He did an enormous, uh, enormously comprehensive study of all the best sports teams of all time and try to figure sort of the red uh, thread between them. Seagull, about a seagull that, you know, doesn't accept being uh, ordinary, but wants to try uh, his or her wings, I guess. And then in terms of investing, this is one book. I don't know if you can see it. It's it's the Pat Dorsey's little book. Mm -hmm. So uh, he um, uh, basically what it did for me, because most of your viewers, I think, know all the classic investment books. But what this one did was, like, it really helped me understand moats. So switching costs, networks, if network effects, and and in a completely different way than I had before, and maybe in a bit modern way, because m many of us might come from from a, where where a moat is a low cost producer, or you know. Um, some brand or something, but like this really will teach you a lot, I think, about uh, the switching costs and, and network effects aspects, which I think are the, the best modes a company can have, really. Interesting. I, I didn't have that that big on my list, so it's a takeaway yeah. <laughs> from this interview, for sure, to look into this book. What did you lead to fi found River Oak and uh, how yeah, what? That's the question. Yeah. Um, so I, I had a I had a key decision in uh, around 2015. So my uh, optimization work I did in in Florida. Uh, my supervisor there became one of my main role models. I think in terms of my professional life. So he started a company and they listed on the Nasdaq in 2016 and. So this was a bit before that, but I sort of thought like, should I go work for him? I was also working with my dad, which was another role model, of course. And I had these two role models. I had a third, I had another job, which was my actual job at, at an institution, uh, Karolinska in Stockholm, not investment related. And I did the investing on the side basically. and. So despite these, uh, you know, I had uh, Jim, which was one role model, I had my dad, which was another. I was like, I couldn't do anything, but I, what I wanted to do was invest. And, uh, you know, it was, it took some time to, to be okay with that, to sort of go in that direction. Uh, I, I heard this great, uh, I saw this talk with, I think it was Jeff Be Bezos, and he said that, you know, you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And once I heard that, I felt, you know, now I have a <laughs> free uh, line to go wherever I want, right? So, so that was the decision. I said, you know, I have to do what I what I love doing, and, and yeah, from from then on, I, I I did it. But basically, the idea with River Oak, it started. It really started January first, twenty thirteen. So it the was the person you mentioned in Florida was the person who asked you about the stock where you finally invested, or was this another? No, no. So, so uh, the algorithm I wrote in in um, at, as my master thesis, it went into his company. So it was at the start of his company. So he founded this company, my supervisor, Vure, it's called, in 2006. And then it was listed in 2016. But he had been this, you know, we had great fun when we were building this uh, algorithm, you know, we were having many late nights in, in Florida, I was there by myself, you know, feeling freedom. Uh, we were having a great time. And, and uh, so, so he just founded a company and I had always like since then, I had it in my mind because he asked me to stay to, to, to work at the company, but I wanted to go back. And uh, since then, I'd always like had it in my mind, maybe I should go work for him. Uh, but but around that time, so say 2015, I decided to uh, you know 
I'm going to do investing full time. And uh, so River Oak really started in 2013. So January 1st, uh, 2013, my mom was my first and only seed investor. You know, it was 400,000 from her and 420,000 from me. And um, it compounded at a decent rate. And, and uh, some people, uh, just friends, started asking maybe this could be set up to, to do something, uh, a company of it. And uh, it took some time, but um, that was really the, the sort of, And I put, you know, I probably put 20 people up on the list, uh, <coughs> you know, an email list, so I could send them results. I said 2013, you know, I'm going to publish results, I'm going to write about it. And uh, most of them probably went on the list to be kind to me, <laughs> not because they were so interested. But uh, that was the, the list that I sent in, in 2017. I basically said, you know, let's, let's try to send it to these uh, 20 people and see if anyone wants to found a company with me. And uh, I remember sending it and I, I believe that, I told my wife that, you know, Let's hope one is interested, at least. <laughs> Probably not, but we'll see. And uh, yeah, 10 of them ended up being interested. So I, I had 10 co-founders uh, at River Oak. So I went around Uppsala and Stockholm, and we all signed the founding documents. So I went around to, to each and every one of them for two days there. Um, and it was really, I think, uh, you know, once you made a decision that you really want to do this I, I could have continued doing it just in the family office structure but i felt uh, it's something that's very very scalable so why not uh, have many other people come along what have been your decent returns in the, f the first period before finding it as a more formal structure well it was about uh, probably It was about 30, below 40, um, I think. Uh, but yeah, between 30 and 40 annualized for, for those four years or so. That's a good return. It is, yeah. And how did you think about setting up the structure? Because you have this interesting structure, you're not a fund, you do capital rises. Um, maybe you can tell more about this. And is this a special structure to Sweden? Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you can do similar things in, in other, I would think. It's a regular company, basically, and, and everyone is a shareholder. So there is no function where you have, you know, uh, in, in a big downturn, like uh, during COVID, uh, in, at the start of COVID, where many funds would have many huge redemptions. So there is no redemption function in that way. You need to sell to another shareholder. So... Yeah, our capital is our capital and, and we can use it to be very long term to invest as we please. And, uh, you know, in listed companies, in private companies. Uh, so I just thought there was many advantages of doing it this way. Uh, there are also one or two fund structures, which is is pretty uncomplicated in Sweden, but uh, then you need to go to professional investors which might be difficult to start out doing. So, so uh, yeah, and I also thought, you know, it, it'd be fun for them to feel that they're shareholders, you know? So, so we, I have bought my shares at the same price that they have bought their shares and, and uh, we're co-owners and, and, you know, they, uh, um, some of them will, uh, you know, come with an idea from time to time and, and uh, becomes more of a, Uh, fun social thing too. Uh, in terms of a fund, I would just have, you know, perhaps uh, many people that I didn't know who they were. Uh, so that didn't feel really meaningful to me to, to do it like that. In your structure, you have a special fund class, uh, uh, share class, or? Yeah, we have two share classes. So, so I, I have A shares. So uh, they have higher voting power at this point. That That's the only difference right now. So... Um, Yeah, I, I want to be able to uh, put in a veto if uh, everyone wants to buy uh, 
you know, uh, invest in this coal mine in Mongolia or <laughs> whatever it might be. Uh, something that is very fashionable, but but perhaps not something where I see much investment merit. So. And compared to the, you already talked about this in your letters, uh, and I find it a very interesting point, compared to the structure of investment vehicles in the Nordics, you just describe yourself as being different. Um, how do you see yourself in relation to other offerings? Yeah, so I think uh, there are quite a few really good investment companies or holding companies in Sweden. Uh, but they are in the billions, most of them. Like they are, you know, two billions, five billion, ten billion, a hundred billion, even uh, with Gustav Douglas, perhaps. And um, so they might actually be quite similar, although I think most of them have fewer shareholders. Uh, we also have Spilta, which is uh, they have a few thousand shareholders, but that would perhaps be the most similar in terms of structure. Um, and if you compare us to the funds, we're just completely different because they have rules of not being able to have a weight higher than 8%. I don't know the rules, but it's complicated. And uh, a lot of work seems to go to, a lot of time seems to go to other uh, things than doing the actual work. Uh, I think it's just a very, very different uh, from A to Z, you know, we're doing everything different. We do have some similarities in, in that we invest in, in publicly listed companies, but that's about the extent of it for most of them. There are exceptions which might be more similar to us, but yeah. As I already mentioned the Nordics, I want to have the chance to ask you a bit about some insights about the Nordics and maybe I want to start with the, I want to start with the question what people get usually wrong about the Nordics and it's one of that's the universe you're mostly investing in um, <clears throat> one thing they get wrong about the Nordics um, it's a bit hard for me to speak about the whole Nordics but maybe hmm Maybe they think it's Switzerland, you know, Sweden. <laughs> Many US people think Sweden is Switzerland. But but in terms of, I think at least, uh, you know, my community, I think they have a pretty decent understanding of the Nordics. I think in, in some cases, Americans come in and they might be, Americans are very ambitious, while Swedes are a bit more, uh, less ambitious by nature. It's a very cultural thing too. So they might come in and say, you know, you need to, uh, I mean, they might have opinions about how a company should be run and they might say, you know, let's uh, let's go faster. Let's do it like uh, we do it in Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. And that might not always be the best recipe for, for Swedish companies. Uh, I think we have a few exceptions, which are, Well, we have many companies which are very ambitious, but perhaps a few famous ones like Spotify, Klarna, iSettle, which really fit the mold when it comes to, you know, going really fast, innovating, uh, being very ambitious and, you know, try to be world leading, basically. But so we don't have many like that. And it's, it's not something that comes natural in the sense. So I, I think it's just important for for. Um, Americans when they, not just Americans, but but generally when, when people come to invest in Nordics, you know, you have to realize that uh, there is cultural factors wh which uh, might not make it suitable. Uh, you know, the Silicon Valley print, my blueprint might not work everywhere for everyone. Uh, you know, uh, some would argue that it's not working for some Silicon Valley Coast company. Too, I, I think uh, we we only hear about the great ones that come out of there, right? So, so there are for many that doesn't work uh, either. But I don't know if that's uh, something they they really get wrong. I, I actually think most have a, a pretty good view and understanding of, of the Nordics as a generally a very well functioning part of the world. And what's the difference between the different markets in the Nordics in your eyes? 
if you compare the Finnish market with the Swedish market, <laughs> the language is one big difference. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the Finnish market is less well known. Many companies there are less well known. We are, you know, there's 10 million people in Sweden and, and in Norway, Denmark and Finland, there's about 5 million. So, so Sweden is twice the size. So it feels like the markets are more uh, analyzed here. So I think maybe you'll be able to find a, find a few uh, you know uh, pieces of gold in in Finland or or something like that. It's uh, there's a higher there might be a higher chance for it in, in some cases where, where where people just don't know about it. But there are more companies, I think, generally in, in Sweden, which has come a far way than, for example, Finland or, or Denmark. Uh, there is no Spotify or Klarna uh, from, from the others that I'm aware of, at least. They're, they're coming. They're coming now, though. Uh, so so they're, it's, um, it, it's a good space because it's so stable. Uh, you know, the... the Population here is is stable. Um, political environment is very stable. Uh, so, I uh, yeah, our preferred uh, geographies are the Nordics uh, and uh, Amer in the U.S. has been historically, but uh, we're also doing some in in China and in South America. But it's. Uh, this is the most stable and, and the, of course, the one I know the most. So it's a huge advantage of in investing on your home court as well. In which companies or patterns are you looking in in the Nordics and your home court? Yeah, so since about five years ago, we have been almost exclusively in, in software companies, online-based companies. Um, and... Um, you usually what I want to see is some strong secular tailwind. So uh, no special situations, no uh, no complicated things, no some of the parts situations, no shorting, no leverage, not, not nothing like that. And and uh, and also you know areas where I think this is an under underestimated thing to 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 uh, keep in mind you know areas which i find really interesting and fun so i will say no to a company where uh, which i am basically sure it's going to be a good investment but i just don't click with it like i can't relate to it for example so i'd say those are the most uh, those are the areas we have been and, and it might sound it might sound you know uh like yeah only software and online based but yeah as you know that's a pretty broad <laughs> area so there are many companies that go under that and if you're investing in china or south america you're losing your home court uh, competitive advantage how you're going about investing there compared yeah. to that, the way yeah, you approach a... investing in the Nord nordics yeah it's a great question so you just have to accept that you do have an information disadvantage when you invest in China or in South America. Uh, so I have a, a friend from, from China, a great investor, and, and uh, yeah, probably one of the uh, best investors in, in China there is. And uh, so, so uh, he asked me about this, and he specifically said that, you know, we do two, three calls every day. We... Um, and know a lot of industry experts. We know a lot of people at the companies, and we still miss a lot of things. <laughs> and that's sort of, we might have been going more and more towards China, and I was expecting us to 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 be be more in China by now. But I sort of realized over the years that you know the only thing you can do there is very well established companies which have a broad. Uh, um, a very broad market, a huge opportunity, and you don't know, you don't need to know all the details. So, so in Brazil, for example, um, there's an interesting situation there with with the payments market. Um, there are two, there are a few new companies now, uh, Stoneco, Pagseguro, and, and there's also a private company, Newbank. And it's interesting there because in 2010, 
this was a, a duopoly basically between two large banks. So one have had an exclusivity agreement with Visa. The other one had an exclusivity agreement with MasterCard. So if you wanted to pay with MasterCard, you needed to go through one of them, right? And if you wanted to pay with Visa, you need to go through others. So stores and restaurants would have two uh, machines, right? <laughs> so, you know, and I guess some of them might have had no machine, uh, only one machine. So if you came in with a Visa card in the wrong restaurant, you might have not been able to pay, <laughs> I guess. And, and they deregulated that. And, um, um, you know, not only was there, you know, these um, uh, machines, which were, you know, you needed to have two, but also like the interest rates and the, the take rates were enormously high. Like, you know, I've heard 10% and, you know, there's one, uh, uh, I read a, um, uh, a former employee at Stoneco said that, you know, I was trying to help a client find their actual take rate in the in the dashboard of these old incumbent large banks, and it was practically impossible. <laughs> so what what Stoneco did, and and um, to some extent Pagsegur too, I think, they came in and they said, you know, we're gonna be hugely transparent. We're gonna have a dashboard. We're gonna show you your take rate front and center. There's no way you can sort of change that. And, and the, the larger banks, they were actually increasing the rates <laughs> until the customer noticed. And then they were like, yeah, sorry. And then they took them down again. Uh, so, so it was like very low hanging fruit to come in and care a little bit about the customers. Uh, and, you know, Stonko has a take rate, I think, just below 2%. And it's founded by by uh, you know um, serial entrepreneurs. So so they know the pain points of uh, with the larger banks. You would have to sit in line for like two hours, three hours to to fix a simple customer support errand. And um, in in uh, what Stoneco did was like is a, we're going to try to answer it you know within minutes, and they measure themselves on on me on metrics like that, and. I think when I find out, found out about it, I, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, I can't really remember. Um, they had a market share of three, four percent, perhaps. And, uh, you know, they had, uh, of course, nowadays, all acquirers accept Visa, MasterCard, uh, American Express, etc. So, and, and, uh, and it was also at a valuation of, of around six billion or so. And I don't need to know that much more than that. Uh, you know, they were uh, taking market shares hand over fist and it was very simple to understand why once you had done some work there. And it was almost impossible to see uh, how, how the banks, you know, how many examples do you know of where you have the incumbents with, with the legacy technology, with the culture that says, you know, we're going to raise rates, we're not going to, really care about the customers, they have to use us. So, so that would be an example where, you know, whether it's Stonego, Pagseguro, or, or the opportunity is just so huge. And you need to have some model, of course, about the valuation, but I don't need to know uh, all details there. So, so that would be the typical situation where, uh, where I'm comfortable in investing uh, globally. So, so uh, in China, for example, you know, cloud adoption. So, you know, e-commerce and, and sort of, it's going much faster in, in China and, and uh, opportunity of course there as well is huge, huge. So, so there are probably a few companies related uh, on that theme in China, which I think are investable, but of course I'm not gonna invest in uh, something that's, uh, say, um, uh, you know, a billion kroner, which we might do here. So a company with a one billion market cap in the Nordics, that's fully investable. That's probably not going to be investable in China. What role does the past play in the way you analyze companies? Because from what you told till now, it sounds you, you're a bit entrepreneurial investor. Yeah, we, we have a, 
I think we have a particularly soft spot for, for companies that enable entrepreneurship. Uh, Stoneco is a great example. Uh, Fort Knox in Sweden is another great example of that. And we're, so I think I personally have a soft spot, you know, uh, after all entrepreneurship and, and, you know, small and medium sized companies, that's the ones that get our economies growing. Yeah, uh, the most part of it, and they, I, I, I don't remember the percentages, but like it's it's probably more than fifty percent of, of growth, and ah, I shouldn't quote the numbers, but but th those are the drivers. So, and uh, yeah, with some entrepreneurial background myself, I think it's natural to to sort of. So, so as I said, I, I really want to invest in in companies where i click with their offering with their product like otherwise it's not very interesting and there are many ways to invest and, and make a lot of money in all kinds of companies but many are not interesting to us simply because because of that um but yeah regarding the past i think you know the past for for me it's a data point so so uh but not much more than that uh, and of course, a good record in the past is oftentimes means a, a good record in, in the future as well. But the key in investing, of course, is uh, there's almost no value in, in the past. Everyone can see the past. You know, it's readily available for in screeners, huge institutions, uh, banks. They have access to, to, you know, loads more data than, than we can have. And uh, so, so uh, everything I do is, is completely focused on the future and preferably the, you know, the next two to five years. That, that's really the basis for all investing. And of course, the past is a good data point. In some cases, a very good data point. But uh, you know, when it's obvious to everyone, there's usually not much value there to be had. So. I think in one of your letters, you, you said you sold Amazon uh, because you saw oh, your advantage I? in uh, small caps. Um, yeah. Do you see I, this op opportunity that there's more advantage in small caps as a rule today? Or did it change that you also see this big opportunity in large uh, caps like Amazon? Yeah, no, I see it as a general rule that, you know, small, small caps and, and mid caps are going to be much more attractive as investments. Now, this has not always been the case for the past five years, uh, I'd say, pretty surprisingly for many. I, I remember when Apple was at, uh, you know, an 800 billion market cap and, and uh, it was really hard to see them, you know, double that value. Right, because you need to add one trillion <laughs> of value. So, but it happened, and and I think that's been surprising to me. Um, I I saw their advantages. I, I just felt that. So, so when we sold Amazon in in 2017, and it was right after River Oak had started, I just felt that we're gonna have a bigger edge in in uh, smaller companies, and we don't really need to. Uh, fight in that pit with the, you know the ten largest companies in the world, uh, and I you know I love uh, most of them to be honest. I mean Amazon is is great obviously, and, and uh, um, they are uh, they are fully investable. It, it just has happened that you know after after that one we haven't invested in the really huge ones. But it's fully open to do that. I think that should rather be regarded as a mistake than anything else, perhaps in the case of Amazon. Um, but, you know, um, this is, uh, will we'll tend to be focused in small and mid caps for sure. Uh, but uh, we will also have the occasional large cap. Interesting. I'm not against that at all. Uh, yeah, it's just that, like, there is, if you look at the case of Amazon, I think it was, uh, don't remember the exact market cap, but so it's probably tripled since then or so. And uh, the thing is that, like, the execution needed for that triple 
I don't think many could see that. Uh, the execution needed for a triple in a small cap with a one billion uh, market cap, of course, is might not require as much. I think this, I mean, in the case of Amazon, it's probably a unique, uh, unique situation in, in uh, history of business. I think. You, know, with your return and what you told about certain companies, you have a certain talent to pick some winners uh, in your portfolio. How are you going about winners? When do you think about selling them? Do you decide to double down on winners and sell the losers? Or is there any framework you're dealing with winners? Not, not really, uh, in, in the sense that when I invest in something, it's always a, a matter of what do I think the earnings power is in two to five years? How does the competitive situation look? You know, the moat, the runway. Uh, and let's say a few years later, and that particular company is up 200%, I will do the exact same analysis three years later. I will say, you know, so how does the situation look over the next two to five years? Moat, uh, is the competitive position better or worse? Uh, will it last? Will, will it erode? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there's the valuation component as well. And, and, uh, but that's taken into account exactly the same way, whether it's a winner or a loser or uh, something in between. So it doesn't affect uh, in any way. So I'm just as likely to you know, double down on a winner as uh, on a, on a uh, as as you know, doubling down on, on something that has done less well, and the same thing about selling. Now, I, I'd say we do not tend to sell often. Uh, that's it's become less and less, and I'd say per year we probably sell one or two or at the most three companies, and it's usually. It's usually a situation where we have found something more attractive or just a, a mistake in the sense that what I believed was has proven to, to be wrong for some reason. It might not mean that you know the invest that that, that the investment uh, merits look poor from this point, but I, I could sell if I misunderstood something and uh, that happens but yeah it, it is boiled down to about one two or maybe three per year and hopefully that goes down even more that's preferable so of course it comes to the question like uh, yeah if you have good returns and the valuations go up at some point uh, companies become uh, too highly valued and, and and that's true and of course there's some price for all companies where we would sell out of valuation alone, but um, I tend to think about that. You know, if you're if you're right about a, a company's runway, about its competitive position, about its uh, you know business, you can basically use you know I, I get teased because I've never used a DCF valuation method. I, I don't I don't I don't think I even know how to do one, to be honest. You can use the DCF, you can use uh, something based on multiples. You know, you think something is worth 20 times earnings, perhaps. Uh, you can use, you know, the second moon landing uh, and you'll still end up with a fine result uh, after a long enough time. And the, say, and the opposite is true too. If you're wrong about these things, if you're wrong about the competitive position, if you're wrong about the, the business and the, the culture there, no matter how great your valuation method is, you know, even if it's exactly right, you're still not going to do very well. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, uh, Charlie Munger has put this really well. He's basically, he basically said something along the lines of, if you invest in a company with a 20% return on capital, uh, even if you pay a high price, after a long enough time, you're as an investor are going to end up with 20% returns as well. 
Conversely, if you invest in something uh, with a 6% return on capital, no matter how cheap price you paid, you know, if you paid a few times earnings, you're still going to end up uh, after a long enough time with about 6%. So uh, that's the key. And uh, I think while I might have come from a from background, you know, uh, old value school, if you want to call it that, you know, uh, Buffett, Graham, of course, um, you, you, valuation might have been the first thing I looked at. But around, I would say, 2015, that changed. And, you know, what I do now is, is uh, all the other things have to check out first. Then you check the valuation. Of course, I want to be sure that it's not something before I start and, and make a project out of it. I want to make sure that it's not completely out there, you know. So uh, no matter how good the business is, I'm not going to invest. But usually that's not the case. And I think that's that's the last thing uh, when we make an investment that I look at. You have Jeff Bezos behind you, if I'm right, with uh, with identifying this picture. Yeah. And he's one of the outstanding managers and the good managers. What role does like management play in your process? Is it a bit like Rob Vinal, who is also looking for the good managers or... Uh, it's always great to have a good, ma a great management team. Um, it's 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 not necessary to do very well. I'll, I um, uh, I can segue a little bit into to Fort Knox. So this was an investment we made about five years ago. Uh, since then, they've had five different CEOs. <laughs> There now we have the fifth, and uh, you know the company has done absolutely fantastic. So uh, the management is always great to, to, to uh, it's great if it's great, but, but it's not the most important thing uh, for me. It's, uh, it's ahead of valuation, but below sort of competitive position, uh, network effects, switching, that sort of thing and the runway of the opportunity and, and demand. Uh, I mean, how sure am I about the future demand? But but it's wonderful if you have someone like Bezos or what else do we have there? Yeah, Buffett on the, uh, that's, that's great to have. And, and I want to see, I want to have a CEO that is hungry, you know, that's ambitious, that doesn't, there are very few CEOs like Bezos Uh, but as long as they're very hungry and, you know, they go the, their own way in, in their business, if they really understand this little small business here, you can, I mean, there are many, many ways to be a great CEO in my mind. And, and, uh, it's of course one factor out of many, but not the most important one. You already mentioned Fort Knox and we want to go deeper into this idea because you already told me in our pre-talk that it's a quite interesting company and there's also the story of holding it is a quite interesting one so maybe we can start with what's the business model and how did you get interested in this company and when yeah so so um it's a bit of a coincidence how i got interested in it because so, so they do a cloud, cloud software for accounting, for sending invoices, for paying salaries, all things that a small business can want to do. And I think there was one key, really key idea there. Uh, there was one key sentence in their annual report around 2014 or so. And it said that in, in a big survey, they had found that out of all companies in Sweden, only 12% were, were using cloud software for accounting. 12%. And this was 20, yeah, 14 or 15. And I, I couldn't, I saw no reason why that wouldn't be at, you know, close to 100% some point in the future. Um, so there's about a million companies in Sweden. At the time they had 
a little bit shy of 100,000 customers. So, you know, it was clear to me that that 12% number would go up a lot. That, that was the, really the key thing. The, the, and then also my wife started working with the software. So I, I sort of saw how I, I saw that and I could compare it to the competitors because remember this was 2015 and you were not seeing the type of sales multiples we're seeing today. So at the time, Fort Knox was considered enormously expensive, uh, eight times sales. Today, we some might say, you know, eight times sales, that's not so much, right? Uh, for many different reasons, and, and, and uh, that's a longer discussion. But basically, uh, at the time, you had, uh, it had sales of 100 million. I was paying 780 million or so for the, for the whole business, so eight times sales. That was like scary, scary business, right? I had never at that point invested in anything close to that expensive. But the thing is, uh, it was eight times sales. But really what I saw is in perhaps three years, number of customers will double. The revenue per customer will go up 50%. So you'd have revenues of 300 million in 2018. And you, I, I remember I thought it would make about a hundred million of earnings that year. So three years out. So I was really paying eight times earnings. I wasn't paying eight times sales. And now everyone would agree that, you know, if you're paying eight times earnings for a company that's growing like wildfire, basically because of this underlying trend that it's, uh, yeah, the 12% was bound to go up basically. Everyone would say, yeah, of course, if you have a, an average, you know, not so fast growing stalwart company uh, trading at 20 times earnings or 25, everyone would say, you know, yeah, it's enormously cheap, right? It should be trading a, a lot higher than the average stalwart company. So, but at the time, it was eight times sales and, and that was scary. But yeah, the key there was to... And I might sound like it was easy, but it wasn't easy at all. Uh, but but it was it was the, the only reason you could do that is because yeah the opportunity ahead and and yeah what do you believe the earnings will be? I think actually this year they will probably have earnings of around three hundred million. So you're really paying like two point five x twenty twenty earnings back then. Uh, and again, this goes back to if. If something is obvious to everyone, you know, there's not going to be much value there. So you want to avoid those situations uh, as much as possible. I think like if it's, if it's extremely obvious, you, you want to find a reason why it's obvious to you and, and not to anyone else. Like why, why do you think you have found it? And there are millions of other smart people out there. Well, why, what, what are you seeing that everyone else? And usually, you know, there is a good reason for for something op optically cheap because yeah it, it's obvious to everyone so uh, uh, it was interesting in that way but what happened is right after the investment so six months or so after they got an offer to be acquired uh, by their main competitor Visma uh, at about 1.4 billion total enterprise value so you had a situation where they were basically break even at this point so very little learnings at this point and uh, the board goes out and, and recommends the offer uh, as uh, being a very good offer the main shareholder sends a deferring view letter out to everyone and says you know this is just about when earnings are going to start to move up a lot and uh, he gave a decent case for it which the board didn't at all the, the board uh, basically said that it's nice because the offer is, is a premium to the last 30 days or whatever 60 days and we also got a fairness opinion <laughs> and i asked to see that fairness opinion and uh, they weren't able to to show it but i doubt there was very much in it uh they did pay like five million for it, uh, 
And at the time, remember, this company basically had no earnings. So it had like maybe a run rate of 10 or 15 or 20 million. So a third of that, they paid in this fairness opinion, paid some lawyers to check the deal. And remember, this was 1.4 billion uh, that would have gone to uh, Visma. Uh, today, I think the market cap is probably above 25 billion. So they almost gave away, you know, 25 billion or so to the largest competitor instead of uh, all the small shareholders. So what happened is that the the offer went through, shareholders voted it through by 70% or so. So the largest, I mean, normally you have a higher percentage of that, but the largest owner and a, a few other large owners also said no. So 30% said no, but uh, shareholders voted it through. And then about two months later, uh, the Swedish competitive authority uh, nixed the deal. So, and what happened then was uh, the stock was trading there about at uh, 23 and the offer was 24. And there was a lot of foreign arbitrage funds I've heard that were looking for this one kroner uh, bounce if the offer went through at 24. So on the day that the offer was uh, uh, declined by the competitive authority, the stock went back down to our initial purchase price of around 15, like like in a day. So we got we got to buy back uh, at that price, and yeah, we had sold at 23 because I didn't want to be a minority shareholder under this this unlisted Visma company. They said that they would accept, uh, go through with the offer if 51% of shareholders accepted it. So you could have a situation where you were there as a minority shareholder owning your shares with no influence, with, with uh, yeah, you're in the hands of, of Isma basically. So we were able to sell at 23, went down back to the initial purchase price. And yeah, from there, uh, it's, it's done what it's done. And basically, if you look at it today, uh, that board, yeah, as I said, <laughs> almost gave away 25 billion. Luckily, you know, the, the competitive authority uh, helped us and I guess should be a hero for all <laughs> small Swedish shareholders, which I think there were many of that, that were able to take advantage. Um, yeah. After this <laughs> interesting twist and turn story how yeah. did the if you're looking back how did the perception of fort knox change because at this time they were some kind of not profitable company um, yeah they had just turned profitable but like it was in the probably millions or at the most a 20 million run rate or so uh, so i don't i don't really know how the perception was before 2015 but my my sense is that it was always very highly valued like at a high sales multiple one of the highest but uh, but it was scary for people to to look at those things at that time Com uh, at least in a very different way as what it is today and i think you know at the end of the day sweden is is sweden and we, we don't have thousands of companies like that we don't have hundreds of companies like that and i think what what investors realize is if you have a company that every quarter delivers like that you know no sign in in a decrease in 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 the growth you know customers are are running over to to become uh, users uh, at some point, and I can't say if it was 2016, 17, or 18, but at some point it was like, this is a very, very different company and, and it certainly deserves a premium. I'm not one to say whether it deserves the type of premium it, it currently has, but but uh, it certainly deserves a, a high premium to not only the average company, but the really good companies and great companies as well, because um, it's hard to think of uh, uh, companies which have a higher switching cost. You know, you're you're very unlikely to change uh, an accounting software. Uh, the network effect here is great because 
they are selling through a lot of accounting agencies. So they have the 12 largest accounting agencies as resellers, basically. And a lot of under a uh, lot of other accounting agencies as well, uh, which, which resell for them. And the more that use it, the more likely it is. So when I started, when we started River Oak in 2017, and there was another company we started in 2015, uh, I didn't really have the choice. It was basically the accounting consultant said, yeah, here is the accounting software. Let's go. It's like, okay, great. It costs 99 a month uh, for the accounting service. Another 99. This is kroner, so 10 euros. 10 euros, yeah. 10 euros. I was just like, what? <laughs> it's yeah. <gonna. laughs> yeah. So so 10 euros for the accounting, 10 euros for uh, invoicing, and this is all integrated. So when you have an invoice, you just book it. It's already booked. Um, you're never going to switch because of that, the price or, or convenience or, or, you know, and all the consultants know it. And not only that, but I think, so, so one... One thing that I always look for in all investments is um, something I read in one of Steven Pinker's books. So about consumer surplus. So think about uh, your washing machine, right? Uh, you might have paid 500 euros for a washing machine. Uh, let's say 500 euros. Now, if I came to you and I said, you know, Tillman, I'm, I'm going to take away your washing machine. Uh, how much do I have to pay you for you to be without your washing machine the rest of your life? <laughs> like it would not be 500 euros, right? You would probably demand, you know, a hundred thousand or, or like you wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the same is true. Like, uh, think about Google. So you're, you're, we're not paying anything for it. If I said, you know, Tillman, I'm going to take away Google for you. And, uh, you know, how much do I have to pay you for not ever using Google? It would be in the hundreds of thousands, right? And for companies, it would be in the millions. So there's a huge, huge consumer surplus in terms of the value they get uh, versus the price. And, uh, of course, this was really the case here as well at Fort Knox because uh, consumer surplus there is like, yeah, I mean, they could probably easily raise prices uh, 30, 50, 100% over time with almost no churn for, for the simple reason that it's not worth the hassle to switch. Like there's all already so such a huge value there. So um, yeah, those were, those were sort of the main... Uh, main things and I, and I think more and more people have realized that over the years and it has become repriced not only in terms of earnings having gone from zero to 300 million but uh, the premium has gone up a lot as well because people realize the advantage of, of having 30 40 percent of the small companies in Sweden and you know cross-selling of that and stickiness of those customers as well and, and great company too like a very entrepreneurial culture and uh, they've done a phenomenal job so it's really fun to, to be a shareholder with, with such a company uh, in many ways in the story you told me there's also your younger you that's a bit shy investing in such expensive companies <laughs> and made the first step into this world of the higher quality companies with the great growth. What enabled this investment in Fort Knox for you to be able to invest in other companies that are, have the same opportunity set? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I credit uh, Pat Dorsey and, and his book actually for, for uh, a lot of the Fort Knox investment and being able to hold it because uh it was a key uh, and it's always in investing you know and in anything else in life I, i think it's always when you see when you do something and you see that it works you dare to do it the next time right so if uh, you do a public uh, talk and uh, you, you know you do it once and it's really scary perhaps a few times or many times But at least you have done it a few times and you know that as long as you're focused on this and, and this, 
it will work. And I think the same was true here because it was really simple if you looked two, three, four years out. There was no, uh, I, I didn't do any, there were no crazy assumptions or, or difficult assumptions even. Uh, I think anyone could have done it. But I think most were looking at perhaps the next quarter, the ne next year, rather than, and the sales multiple, you know, uh, the, the valuation based on, on the current year's earnings, which is really relevant in, in fast growing companies. So I think that was a key moment because I, I and I, it, it felt good too, to, to, as I said, there are so many reasons why it felt good because the business risk is almost zero in such a company. If you're paying five times earnings for something, you're going to have a big business risk usually. So it might not feel as good uh, for many other ways, you know, you want to sleep well, you want to feel good about your investments, you want to, uh, you know, be able to look your kids in the eye and say, you know, we only invest in, in, company that, in companies that we believe, that I believe are doing good things uh, and, you know, providing great value. So, so, you know, typically avoiding those that, you know, charge you a 12% take rate or whatever it was in, in Brazil. Uh, so, so it's a combination of, you know, seeing that it works, uh, having all these variables, which I think are, are stronger, uh, carry stronger investment merits, like a very strong network effect, a very strong uh, high switching cost. Uh, that carries more weight to me uh, than than uh, you know paying eight times earnings or five times earnings or, or whatever it might be so so um, it took some time and i i don't want to say it was a simple transition in any way uh, but um and, and to be clear, I prefer, we do, of course, prefer the five or eight or 12 times earnings if we have all these qualities that we want to have. But uh, so I don't have anything against that at all. It is great if you can have it, but usually you can't. And, and if you look at many of the largest success stories we have in the world today, you look at Amazon, you look at Microsoft, you look at Google, you look at Netflix, there are very few moments over the past 10 years where you've had a chance to, to buy them very, very cheap, right? So th the risk is just as if you're waiting for this uh, big once in a lifetime black swan, which really crashes the markets. The risk is that you're gonna wait, you know, until you have gray hairs and, and uh, <laughs> your kids are all grown up and, and you're about to uh, thank you for yourself. So. It's, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's the one variable I, I would, you know, be, be uh, more open-minded about, uh, in ter especially if you come from my background. Uh, perhaps many of your, of your viewers come from this background of, of, of uh, you know, the, the Graham background where, where you're really trying to do it quantitatively. It was a whole different business case back then to do something quantitatively because uh, there you could have an information knowledge edge, right? If if you just know knew some data, this is not possible anymore. So uh, yeah, I think to to find a really good investment opportunity of the day, you really have to look for these things which are not obvious, which might sound extreme to to many people, but which are actually not that strange and you're not making any crazy assumptions. I mean, I'll tell you one example I heard about uh, COVID when it came. So in the beginning, the number of cases was doubling like every two or three days. And everyone agreed that that was the case. And everyone agreed that we had X cases uh, on say uh, March 15. And when you did the math by April 15, we would have millions and millions of cases. It was very simple math, <laughs> but and this was, I think, uh, what's his name, uh, Paul Graham, uh, Graham of Y Combinator. He wrote something like this: "This is exactly what happens when you 
when you tell a friend about this, you, you tell them, you know, we have uh, 100,000 cases today. They're going to double every three days. And uh, they all agree on those two points. But when you tell them, yeah, so that results in 5 million cases on April 15, they'll say, no, <laughs> because it's not intuitive, right? It's not obvious for everyone. So, so yeah, I don't know if it was a great example, but it's sort of, uh, it's certainly a case where it's not obvious to everyone and, and there is a lot of value to be had usually. You started with a Graham-like toolbox of instruments and frameworks and yeah, stuff so like that. What kind of tools you're not using anymore and have thrown out of this toolbox you, you're having now? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I, I could probably even, I probably even had some rule that say, I'm never going to pay more than eight times uh, this year's earnings, which is really stupid <laughs> to be honest, uh, or next year's earnings. Like uh, those type of quantitative rules, I, yeah, those are definitely out. I'm not sure if I had one of those, but I probably did. So that's certainly one that's, that's out. Um uh, Let's and in see. terms of mental models or concepts, frameworks? Yeah, but I think even with, with Graham, it's it's really interesting. And perhaps not too many know this. Like he had, he ran a fund for 10 or 20 years. He had very good returns. But at the end of it, you know, of course, he made the investment in Geico. And the profits from Geico surpassed all the profits accumulated from all other investments combined. So I think if there is one big takeaway from that, um, that's it. Like you have, you found one company like that with, with this enormous opportunity, this enormous runway. Uh, and I think, yeah, he believed that he was paying a fairly high price. Uh, so um, he still did it. I don't know the background of any of it, but but like the you can't argue with the results of it. So I, I really think that's the case because so much work they put in and, and Buffett, I think, has said this too. He was filling out the forms and like checklist for like three, four, five, six points, which needed to be fulfilled, or else they wouldn't make the investment. And and you contrast that with uh, uh there was once a, a company in, in uh, Sweden and I send uh I sent the, the largest owner, this was uh, for Knox too, actually. And I, and I send them, you know, this great detailed uh, valuation uh, model of like, I'd written a full page and, you know, spent a few hours uh, with the numbers, like uh, motivating all of it. And I remember him saying something along the line, like when he responded, I was expecting, you know, a few comments on, <laughs> three or four of the assumptions I'd made. It was basically just like, yeah, uh, nice work. I think the earnings will go up a lot from here. Uh, and that's it, you know. And oftentimes perhaps you don't need to know that much more. Uh, so I think that's a big takeaway in terms of like, for me at least, don't use those types of checklists and, and very strict, uh, models in terms of uh, you know being very uh, computerized about it if you will because every situation is different every company is different and, and uh, some broad guidelines there is uh, mental models is of course great to have but uh, um, for me personally I, I don't use any type of checklist in that way but some would call the checklist of, you know, does it have a big opportunity? Does it have a, a strong moat in terms of either switching cost or a network effect? So that's some type of checklist too, I guess. But it's very uncomputerized, um, uh, very, very, very bendy, if you will. Yeah, I have the oh. same structure. And it's more having a set of questions you, you often ask, but not a checklist and... Uh... Yeah, a sort of open-minded checklist, yeah. I'd, I'd call it, uh, because, because it's it's different. Even if you're at a very similar company, the ones we've spoken about in Brazil or in Sweden, you know, they're going to be 
the chef checklists are going to be different, right? Just there. So, but yeah, the, the overall, I think, uh, the overall um, things that we have spoken about, competitive position, the the opportunity, the runway, those are there. So that's my checklist, I guess. For you said you have this framework where you're looking at the companies, what happened with them in three to five years. Um, what would you say if I offer you a company called River Oak? Uh, With a manager, you know, what would you say is the plan for the next three to five years and how would the structure evolve, change? What can we expect from this company? <laughs> oh, I think, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've started something. So, so I mentioned, you know, 2013, so it was uh, 800 and something thousand. 820,000 and it's about uh, 140 million today uh, we probably raised uh, around 45 of that 7 million was raised last week actually but but yeah so it's gone pretty fast to to where we are today and uh, um, but we're still tiny I think in, in the big scheme of things so so there is you know a uh, a long runway for, for growth in that sense. Uh, and uh, I doubt that the structure will, will change much. There could be some parallel vehicle, perhaps, uh, geared towards larger investors, perhaps. Um, and the two would cooperate, I think. Um, but, you know, I think mostly it's just, uh, you know, Keep having fun every day. Keep improving and evolving every day, and uh, you know, hopefully, in investors are, are happy with with the way it's it's developed so far, and and hopefully, something similar can be attained over the next uh, five to ten years. And uh, there is no grand vision in terms of you know reaching a certain uh, amount of assets. I, I don't think that's a very meaningful goal and you, and you also want to be opportunistic in terms of opportunities that come up like so uh, it's possible certainly that we will do some private investments in, in small nordic companies but uh for now I, i think it's it's mostly more of the same and i'm, I'm happy that we have uh, we have investors from many uh, companies now even three continents so you know hopefully add one or two continents maybe And I hope the Arctis as well at a certain point uh, that you have the sixth continent uh, <laughs> yeah. in your fund structure. That would be something. Yeah, I, I hope we can, uh, perhaps we can do a field trip there. Uh, What? I want to go with the last question to this optionalities or this opportunities you're seeing. You mentioned investing in Swedish small and mid caps directly. What other opportunities are in your head? Um, Uh, so I think to, to, uh, we're, we're mainly focused in the Nordics. I think we will continue to be focused in the Nordics, but it's certainly possible, you know, when, when the world opens up again, um, I was planning, we were planning to do a trip to China last year. Uh, Brazil is on, on the list too. And, and those are two interesting Very interesting geographies that I know somewhat now after a few years of studying them. Uh, so, so you, yeah, when you become more familiar like that, it's it's certainly opens up the door to to do more there. And and there are loads of opportunities there, I'm sure. Uh, but just simply because of the fact that that uh, yeah, home court advantage is is so big after all and uh, probably if you take all accumulated profits since uh, you know over those past eight years i would say that more than 50 percent have come from nordics 
for sure. So, so there is. Uh, it's important to be to be humble about you know what led to our results so far. It wasn't investing in in any private companies, uh, for example, unlisted ones in Sweden. The process there is completely different, of course. Uh, it, it wasn't investing in in other geographies like say Africa or. or um, Southeast Asia or, or, or what have you, it was really done in the Nordics primarily. And I, and I think it's important to, to realize that and keep that in mind. How what do you think about growing your team or grow, even making it a team? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd be the first to, to hire uh, a team as soon as I saw that, you know, it would benefit shareholders, it would benefit our returns. Uh, and I mean, it might be a, a one man band in terms of uh, the, the, oper the regular days in terms of employees at River Oak. But it's really like every day I work with, you know, many other investors and friends that It almost feels feels like we're working at the same company, even though they have their own vehicles and so forth. But uh, if if you didn't have that social aspect, I would hire someone tomorrow, <laughs> without a doubt, because uh, yeah, it's a lot more fun. I do think at the end of the at the end of the research process, uh, so I like to say like when you find out about the company name. It's a key moment, of course, in the terms of making an investment, but about it's about 1% of the work. So you have 99% of the work left to do yourself. And uh, so, so when, you do, when you do that with uh, uh, some of your friends, some of your colleagues, I do think at the end of the day, it's great to have one decision maker in terms of you know, how much do we allocate, It's very difficult. Uh, I mean, let's take you and me, Tillman. We have uh, different backgrounds. We have very different uh, knowledge uh, in terms of, you know, what industries we know, perhaps. Like, it's pretty difficult if, if you come with 50% of the portfolio and I come with the other 50%. Like, how do we allocate that? How do we come to agreement? So I think there are a few cases where It's been done and it's, it works very well. Uh, Ocean Link in, uh, in China is one I would mention that comes to mind. There are two people there that they think very, very much alike. So I think then it can work. Uh, but they also have some differences, I think, in terms of um, you know, their personalities, which is a, can be a great compliment. But I think it's hard to, to make that work and make it work really well. At least I don't know too many examples of it, but I love to do it, so I, I might. <laughs> we'll see. Are you taking interns? Uh, not so far. Uh, we have uh, we have had the uh, uh, question up, um, and it's probably on, on me. We have a board, so we have discussed it, uh, and I took it upon me to to. Uh, look it up, but I haven't gotten there yet. So <laughs> thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Might be an opportunity also for an interested viewer who made it till the end of this conversation to reach out to you if you're okay with this. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And I think preferably located here in, in, in Sweden. So there's an opportunity for the people who you this interview to the end. I was a Do you want something to add for the end? No, no I mean um, it's uh, if they um, if it's a good match, we're we're absolutely open to to, to doing that for sure. I am. Um, so yeah, good idea. Do you want to add something to the general conversation as well? Mm, I don't know. Are you gonna? Uh, We started with your speed dating question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, um, I have something to add here. Oh, I think, I mean, uh, if, 
if I look back at the sort of key moments I, I've uh, spoken to here, uh, you know, there there was this uh, uh, key moment of, of stop taking shortcuts, uh, and the other key moment of like really doing what you love. Uh, I would say, you know, if you want to do something well in life, and most of us want that, uh, even you know, some of us are more ambitious, some of us are less ambitious, but I think we all want to do, uh, you know, we all want to do our jobs well. And the best way to do your job well is to really love what you do. You, you're never going to be able to do great things in a job you, you don't love. I think that's uh, uh, something I've certainly taken away uh, from life at this point. And, and uh it keeps proving true over and over again. You see so many examples of it. So maybe that. That's a good word for the end. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for, for the viewers taking the time to watch this video or this podcast. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tilma. It was a lot and of fun. Anytime. Bye-bye to you. Bye. <laughs> bye to you.